uh, Father, we're about to open your word. What amazing thought that we have your word in front of us. And I just pray for Mike as he unopens, he, as he opens some of these truths that are otherwise buried, but they're all there for the gleaning. And we want to glean tonight. And thank you for everybody that can be here online and in person. And uh, I just pray your richest blessing on them. Mm. And it's in your son's name, Father, we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm in a moment going to read. Actually, I'm going to read the first 11 verses. Uh, because tonight we have verse 8 left from the old notes. And then we'll go through the new notes, which is ver on verses 9 to 11. The new notes that I gave you last week. Um, and so verse 8 of the old notes. And then uh, we'll go through the new notes. So I'll just go ahead and read the first 11 verses. Titus chapter 3, 1 through 11. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and, and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. And as, I mean, as for a person who stirs up division... After warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. All righty. So, in verses uh, one and two, he told us how to conduct ourselves with respect to those outside the church. Verses three through seven, uh, three through seven, yes. He told us why we can do that. Uh, and he reminded us that we were just as sinful and hard to get along with as those outside of the church are. Uh but that God ha was gracious to us in Christ Jesus and saved us by sending his son, uh, the incarnate son, to live a perfect life and uh, go to the cross and die for our sins um, and uh, satisfy the wrath of God. And he's... Uh, he sent his spirit. So it's through the Son incarnate and the Spirit outpoured uh, that he saved us. The Spirit 
tracked us down. He uh, he changed the moral condition of our life, of our nature, that is, and which does change the moral condition of our life. That's Paul's point in the entire epistle. But the Holy Spirit tracked us down, convicted us of our sin, um, uh, and uh, changed the moral condition of our nature and thereby directly showed us the logic, gave us uh, understanding of the logic and grace of the gospel and applied Christ's work to us, which what was involved in that was not only changing the moral condition of your life, but making, uh, uh, placing you in Christ, wrapping Christ's identity around you. When the Holy Spirit took up permanent residence in you, you are identified with Christ. That was the whole point. He uh, connected you uh, um, and united you to Christ. And, and therefore, you were sons, adult, uh, adults, uh, children in the family of God. And, um, and you were given eternal life. And the promise of seeing God, being face to face with Him, uh, and and that's why we can be gracious to others as God has been gracious to us. That's uh, Paul states that again in Philippi Philippians Ephesians four thirty one and thirty two. Um, and then in verse 8, he says that, uh, that these things are to be taught. He says in verse 8, he says, the saying, and uh, most believe that the saying that he's referring to is the gospel as he summarized it, yeah. verses 3 through 7. So, uh, uh, you know that, uh, you know that part of the elk's property is on a list the same says for housing? Not me. Right. Uh, anyway, he, um, says this saying, this gospel that he summarized. So the gospel and all of its teachings, all of its implications, uh, that's what he's talking about. The gospel is the fountain of everything God is doing in our lives and in the church. This saying, this gospel teaching um, is trustworthy. And I and he goes on to say, I want you to insist on these things. That is, teach this method, I mean message <laughs> repeatedly and with authority. Remember, look in chapter two, verse 15, if somebody wants to read that verse. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Okay, again, these things in verse 15, see this verse 15 follows the uh, um, the Paul's explanation of the gospel in verses 11 through 14. Um, and, and his point in 11 through 14 is the behavior of, the way that we treat one another within the church is based on what God did to us in salvation, which is um, summarized in verses 11 through 14. Uh, and, and then in verse 15, this is all in chapter two, he does his same thing. These, you know, be teaching these things, teach these things. Uh, he calls them these things uh, in verse 15 of chapter 2, he calls them the, the saying, 
in chapter three, uh, verse eight. Uh, so he's saying, he's driving the point home in both chapters uh, that uh, this message, this gospel message uh, is to be taught repeatedly and with authority, with apostolic authority. We have no other gospel. Uh, the Christ sent his apostles to declare this gospel and to build the church on the ministry of the apostles. We see that in Ephesians chapter 2. The apostles were the foundation, Christ being the cornerstone. And so there is no other authoritative message from God as to how we are to be um, in right relationship with him and as to what God is up to in the world through the gospel uh, in building his kingdom. So these things are to be taught, insisted on. They're to be proclaimed authoritatively. Now, Does this mean that Paul is saying, I want you just repeatedly to be telling these people verses 3 through 7 from chapter 3 and verses 11 through 14 of chapter 2? Are we supposed to, do we just concentrate on those seven verses and just say them all the time? Clearly, that's not what he's saying. But if you look Obviously, throughout the New Testament, uh, there's almost no epistle that doesn't repeat this gospel message. So in all of our teaching, in all of our studying the word of God, um, all of it is based on this gospel message. And this gospel message cannot be obscured cannot be modified, cannot be changed, uh, cannot be diminished. Uh, we cannot uh, walk away from it in our teaching. This is the message that is central and key to what everything God is doing. Uh, remember, remember the, the, um, the familiar uh, um, description of the storyline in the Old Testament and New Testament throughout the entire body Bible. Um, Old Testament is promise. New Testament is fulfillment. Old Testament points to Christ. New Testament looks back to Christ. Everything led up in biblical history, everything from the creation, led up to this high point of Christ's first coming and uh, redeeming us. And everything flows out of that. It's an unfolding and an application of what Christ purchased uh, at the cross. So that's, I, I think that's what he's, uh, getting at here, insist on these things. Do <clears throat> not let this gospel message slip from the central place that it has in scriptures. Do not let that slip from the central place in our teachings, in our teaching and preaching and all that. Anybody have any question about that or want to add to that? I mean, he kind of mentions that in uh Ephesians 4 2 not 4 verses 2 but 4 Ephesians also. 4 also thank you <laughs> uh, but uh you know referring to like unity in the body and you know how like why am I in here but I just had it but um there's first verse of chapter 4 is that what you're no, well, like the first, like, 
the first four verses of chapter of chapter four in Ephesians four. If I could find it, it doesn't want to show up all this thing now because I can't hear this. Okay. Um well yeah, okay, so three verses three eager to maintain the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one father of all, who is all over through all and in all. So basically it's like, he's saying like what Titus is referring to, what he is referring to in this is that, you know, you are supposed to be. I don't know where I was going to go with that, but like you're supposed to be training up in the body as far as like in the unity. Like everybody's supposed to be doing the work of right. encouraging. Yeah, exactly. One another. Exactly. And, and uh, that flows out of uh, um, the teaching in the church insisting. Uh, on on uh, this gospel message. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so I immediately thought of that first uh, chapter four. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah the verse one of mm -hmm. chapter four. Therefore, walk mm -hmm. in unity. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the therefore pointing back to? The Everything that was said before exactly it's the uh it's it's uh in the first half of ephesians what christ accomplished mm -hmm. what god accomplished through sending his son incarnated and his spirit outpoured mm -hmm. and he says in verse one of chapter four therefore walk in mm -hmm. unity which is uh, like the same thing in chapter two verse 15 declare these mm -hmm. things like you were just saying right yeah yeah. Hmm. So, what is the purpose of insisting that this uh, uh, on these things, on this gospel message, on this um, on this teaching? What is the purpose of of that, or uh, the result? Based on verses fifteen. Or based on the second half of chapter three, verse eight. Oh. The first half of the verse says the saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things. What's the purpose or result? Oh, yeah. It's uh, so that those who believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Right. So that little phrase, so that, that points you to the purpose or result it can be either or both okay. um and um and the result is that believers would be careful to devote themselves to good works uh, again um the phrase, well, I already said the phrase, so that points to the goal or purpose for insisting that the churches in Crete receive this trustworthy message. And that goal is that they devote themselves to good works. Here again, we see the main thrust of Titus and Paul's letter to Titus. Uh, sound doctrine leads to sound living. This statement of the gospel is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things. Mm -hmm. These these are to be central to our teachings. Uh, why? So that believers will be enabled to uh, devote themselves to good works. Sound doctrine, the trustworthy message, the trustworthy uh, saying leads to sound living, devoting themselves to good works. Now, remember, uh, somebody read um, 
what's before I direct you to that passage, let me ask this question. What is the context of Paul insisting on um, this sound, trustworthy method, message being insisted on so that people would, so that believers would devote themselves to good works? What is the context of Paul uh, uh, getting across the message that sound doctrine leads to sound living? What's the context here in the in uh, the Cretan churches? Oh, that that I think there were like false teachers around, and, right. and Paul was trying to let Timothy and Titus know that hey, like yes, you know, look out for these people. And and not only that, he said in chapter one. You you need to uh, oh, appoint elders in every yeah. church, yeah. and they must hold to sound doctrine. They must hold to the faithful word as taught, and the implication there is as taught by the apostles. So it's the apostolic faith, the trustworthy saying. Uh, they must hold to that, and and they must be able to refute um false teachers and uh to silence their um what they're teaching to silence them so i don't know what i was going to ask after <laughs> asking you that i don't remember now uh but so we, we see paul throughout this letter returning to this theme it is a major thrust of the theme sound doctrine leads to sound living and he's given us an example of that in both chapter two and in both and in chapter three both chapter two and both chapter three chapter two how do we act toward one another inside the church and at the end of chapter two, it's the reason you can do this is because God of God's saving work in you. So, so uh, teach these things with all authority. Chapter three, this is the way you are to act toward those outside of the church. And this is why you can do it. Because despite you were the fact that you were just as bad, as those outside of the church that you're having trouble getting along with, you were, despite the fact that you were that bad, God didn't let that stop him from being gracious and merciful and good to you and saving you. Uh, and in Thank you, Lord. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so that's why you can be gracious to other because of the work that God has done in you. So this is a trustworthy saying, insist on these things. Um, so that's, you know, that's the thrust of the book of Titus um, right there. Um, Are the works that he's talking about here the same as in Ephesians 2.10? Bill, you just... Yeah. Jogged my memory. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I I smelled your notes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. So compare this, compare what he says there in verse at the end of verse eight to Titus chapter one verse sixteen. If somebody wants to read that, Uh, oh. One old man to another. Phil will just lean on each other and walk that way. <laughs> well, I do need to lean. <laughs> uh, verse 16. Yes. Chapter one. Uh, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Yeah. I mean, those are the false teachers. Uh, like wolves in sheep clothing. They are fooling people uh, by telling, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer. 
but then they try to share new special insight in to the gospel, but it's way wandering away from the apostolic faith. As a matter of fact, it's in uh, exact contradiction of the apostolic faith. Uh, you can do whatever you want. God's gracious. Uh, he's not going to, he's not going to zap you. Um, any, uh, all kinds of variations on that theme that we, that we find uh, in the New Testament um, was being passed around by false teachers and they were living godless lives and taking advantage of believers and uh, um, using it as a, using their influence and their teaching as a source of monetary gain. Um, we have the same thing going on nowadays, don't we? You think? Yes, yes. So this this is this it was not by accident that Paul summarized uh the false teachers the way he did in verse 16. Uh they are unfit for any good work. Paul in both chapters two and three says the gospel has fitted believers for every good work false teachers in chapter one they are unfit for any good work um so paul's theme the the uh the the major thrust in in this letter has been sound teaching leads to i mean sound doctrine leads to sound teaching and so the way he has approached it is in chapter one he has told us this is why church leadership must have sound doctrine and sound living. You've got to see it uh, in them. It's got to be um, uh, a reliable thing. Doesn't mean that they're perfect. Doesn't mean that they don't make mistakes all over the place. Doesn't mean they don't sin every day. But what it does mean is that they're dealing with that sin uh, and uh, and they're they are consistently dealing with that sin and they are teaching sound doctrines and they are living lives that can be imitated. So that's uh, and false teachers have, neither sound doctrine nor sound living. They are unsound in both of those things, unsound in their doctrine. And of course, because of that, they're unsound in their living. And then uh, in chapters three, two and three, he goes and shows us how sound living uh, flows from sound doctrine. So that's that's the way he's organized this whole thing. So it's it's just interesting that in verse the second half of verse eight, and then in verses nine through eleven, he closes with returning back to false teachers. Let's uh, let's go through those notes on uh, nine through eleven. You'll notice. Um, well, let me just read this uh, introductory paragraph that I've given you there for uh, verses 9 through 11 of chapter 3. But he, so after he does these three things, church leaders must, oh, did I? You I'm still sorry. there, Jan? I just <laughs> cut her off. <laughs> So I'll lean with my arms down. Uh, uh, you and Bones today. I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. Bones today. Not I, I don't know if, if it cut it off or not. Are you there, Jan? Boy, they. It says done. Does that mean the call? Oh, I think the call ended. It, did the call. it says done? Up, yeah. Oh, is she oh, she's back? trying to call. <laughs> 
So hit the phone maybe. What does she do? Or down there maybe? This? Yeah. Chan? I'm sorry. Mike, did you throw her in the trash too? I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so go into your recents and call her and and, and <laughs> oh, there she is. Somehow I got on FaceTime with her. Yeah, oh. that when you hit that little camera okay. that switched it to FaceTime. Speaker. See, I couldn't do an iPhone. This is why I have Android. Uh can let's see. Can She's you... on a house phone, isn't she? She what? I thought she was on a house phone. No, she's no. on a cell phone. Oh, well, good. It's the landline that doesn't work. And so oh, uh, okay. Okay. your connection is unstable. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay, so moving on, verses 9 through 11. Um, Paul brings the body of the letter, the entire letter, the body of it. Uh, we still have verses 12 through 15, which is the is the closing. Uh, but the body of the letter, he brings uh, uh, to a close, and particularly verses 3, 1 through 8, by returning to the issue of false teaching. He contrasts, uh, and that little word but at the beginning of verse 9 sets up the contrast. He contrasts uh, what should be taught and done, verse 8, with mm -hmm. what should be avoided in teaching and behavior, verse, first half of verse 9, and then gives the reasons for avoiding such teaching and behavior. So uh, in verse 9, he's dealing with the teaching itself, okay? And so then after telling Titus what to do about the false teaching that that is uh avoid it he paul gives instructions for dealing with the false teachers uh, verse 10 they're identified as divisive persons so that's what he does in verse 9 through 11 um what he said in verse 8 prompts him to uh, return to this issue of confronting false teachers. And he says in verse nine, avoid their teaching. <laughs> <laughs> I should use my right hand. There. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> he says in verse nine, avoid their teaching. And, he's, and in verses 10 through 11, shun false teachers avoid, avoid false teaching in verse nine shun false teachers so that's that's the way we are to deal with false teachers in the church and we'll we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute what are we going to talk about uh how do we apply that nowadays okay um but anyway so let's just read verse nine. This, uh, um, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are un, um, profitable. unprofitable and worthless. Notice in verse eight, he said, insisting on this uh, on uh, this trustworthy saying that is the teaching of the gospel uh, results in people devoting believers devoting themselves mm -hmm. to good works and these th and these things are excellent and profitable for people in verse 9 he says but but, avoid false teachings avoid these controversies because they are unprofitable um and, and more than that they're worthless, 
Yes, exactly. You're making Joe crack up. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> and I'm thoroughly distracting myself. Well, your arm looks like it's a prosthesis that's hanging out. I know. Out. <laughs> I, I, I want to use them, but I'm multiplying reasons not to. <laughs> okay. So um, verse nine, that little phrase, but avoid. The word but sets up the contrast between verses eight and nine, sets up the contrast between things I want you to speak confidently in verse eight, first half of verse eight, with things he wants him to avoid in verse nine. So that's the contrast that's set up by that little word but. And then um, he, Paul lists four things he wants Titus and the Christians on Crete to continually avoid uh, without looking at the notes and looking at the verse. Can you uh, point out, can you name those four things? Look, but you can look at the verse. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, I thought she said neither. Uh -huh. Oh, no, I meant without looking at the notes, but looking just at the verse. Uh, oh. Oh, well, I'm looking at the verse now. Yeah, good. Foolish well, controversies? Yeah. Yes, that's one. Uh, and then... Genealogy? Genealogies, yes, that's two. I'm reading the wrong verse, I guess. Moral, morals about the law. Yes, and we skipped one. Uh, Dissension. Yes, very good. Dissension. So those four things, foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. As I mentioned here, uh, these are aspects of the false teaching about which he had already warned us in chapter one. Maybe somebody wants to read chapter one, verse, verse 10, verse 14, verse 16. Uh, okay, verse 10. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. Uh, they must be silenced since they verse are... 14. Oh, verse 14. Oh, verse 14. Sorry. Um, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths or the or and the commands of the people who turn away from the truth. And then you said... Verse 16. Verse 16. Okay, and then they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Yes, so he mentioned, he, he mentions the, the uh, foolish controversies and genealogies and quarrels about the law. Uh, and, and we talked about this in chapter one, that Paul did not explain much at all about the content of the false teachings. He didn't, he didn't explain what the false teachers were teaching. He just said they're false teachers, and you got to silence them. Uh, in 114 and 39, he mentioned that these false teachings. Uh, that the false teaching is concerned with Jewish myths, genealogies, and quarrels about the law. And that in, in um, again, in verse, in chapter one, he tells us that this false teaching opposes and turns away from the apostolic teaching. So it's, it's concerned with Jewish myths, genealogies, and quarrels about the law. And as such, it turns away from the apostolic teaching. That's the that's the central thing there. So they were arguing about like things of the Old Testament, like yes, like well, not just the Old Testament, but like Jewish myths. Oh, okay. And they would go to genealogies and and pick out things about genealogies, and then they would quarrel about the law. Uh, but those things that they uh, taught and argued over 
uh, first and foremost, oppose and turn away from the apostolic teaching. Mm -hmm. And in verse 11 of chapter 1, their motivation was monetary gain. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they weren't in it for the sheep. They were wolves that were in it for their own personal interest. And so they would go to the Old Testament because remember the New Testament was just being written yeah. in those times. There was not a collected New Testament. A lot at this time, most of the New Testament uh, documents had been written. Not John's, not his gospel and his three letters in the book of Revelation, and uh, not Second Timothy, um, maybe not Jude, maybe not Second Peter, but most of the New Testament documents had been written and were being circulated, either verbally or even the actual text itself mm -hmm. being circulated amongst the churches, but they had no collection of it into a book. That was to come later. And so what these false teachers had was the Old Testament, and they saw an opportunity to satisfy their own desires and lusts. And um, here Paul fingers uh, monetary gain. That's the big one. But in other in other writings, he talks about taking advantage. Uh, um, Paul talks about this. Jude talks about this. Peter talks about this. Taking advantage, uh, um, um, satisfying their immoral desires, um, uh, their immoral sexual desires. So that those were their, their motives. Um, and the description that we see here in uh, in Titus is very similar to the description we see in the Ephesian churches. Uh, oh, did you want to read First Timothy 1, 3, and 4, and 6 and 7? Sure. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Hmm. Number six, certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Yeah, and then later on in the epistle, he talks about their motives too. So uh, this is what was going on. This is what was going on in the first, in the first century church there. And we're, remember, we're probably in the early to mid 60s AD here. Some of the apostles uh, had been killed. Some of them uh, are, uh, had left uh, that area, taken the gospel to various, you know, Thomas is reported to have taken the gospel to India. Uh, so there was, there was probably more than half or more of the apostles that weren't on the scene in the Roman Empire at this time. And uh, so when you say 60, that is that 30 years after? Jesus? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then some people 30 were, or more. So 30 people, to 35 some years people after. Were still some people were alive when Jesus was crucified then during that time. So they would have sure. known, they would have known. They would have remembered right. reading reading this. Like, oh right. okay. Right, right. Mike, can you summarize what Nick said? Uh he just asked. So that was 30 years or so after uh Christ lived, and we said yes, and he said, so that means that some of the people uh, that read, that are, that these letters are being read to were alive during Christ's life, and they saw uh, or heard about all the events of Christ's life and death and resurrection and the 
uh, and uh, the first spreading of mm -hmm. the church. Uh, and so they would have known um, they they were in a position to recognize the the falsehood of the false mm -hmm. teachers. And uh, yeah. so that's essentially what he was saying. Yeah. Paul wisely doesn't give us and he doesn't enumerate 16 things that they were doing. Yeah. And you know why I think that I think part of the reason for that is notice in verse eight, he says, insist on this in your teaching, insist on in your teaching. <laughs> I, have to, I have to protect my friend here. Uh, in your teaching, insist on this trustworthy message, but avoid the teaching of the false teachers. And so it's not surprising to me that he doesn't go into detail mm. about what the false teachers were teaching. Avoid it. Mm -hmm. They were aware. Clearly, they were aware of what was going on. And uh, also, um, I think it's good for us because then we take this this uh these instructions from paul and we say okay what does this mean for us what's false teaching what false teaching are we to avoid so it's not like we can see um it's not like we have as phil said details the 16 things that false teachers were teaching we don't have the details of what they're teaching and we can look at that and say oh well nobody's teaching that nowadays uh um and be fooled into thinking that false teaching is exactly like what was being taught by the false teachers in the first century false the church has struggled has battled uh struggled against and battled false teaching ever since the church was born and um and that will continue until christ returns and that's paul's whole point that's why the church must church leaders must have hold faithfully to sound doctrine must be examples of sound living so they can they can um refute the false teachers silence them and equip the saints with sound doctrine so that they respond in sound living um so that's the whole thrust of the letter so it's not surprising to me even though sometimes we wish well, I wish I knew exactly what they were teaching, exactly what you're talking about here. We can we can we can put it together a little bit by uh, looking at uh, what Paul does call out their behavior and the um, antidote to that false teaching. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we can surmise somewhat. For instance, in Jude, verses three and four, he says, I was going to talk to you about, uh, well, let's just read it. Verses three and four of Jude. I don't need to ask what chapter, do I? No. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Deepak. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay, and um, and we have seen statements like that in Titus, in First Timothy, 
in um, Second Peter, we've seen statements like that in Christ's letters to the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Uh, and we can surmise from that that they are they are perverting the grace of God into licentiousness. That is, they are you can you can look back and say, okay, uh, they are perverting the message of grace in the gospel, and this is their perversion of it. Because of Christ's death on the cross, uh, we can live the way we want. Now, they can add other things to it, like the Gnostics added that the physical realm uh, doesn't mean anything. It's worthless. Only the spiritual realm matters, and so it doesn't matter what you do with your body. As uh, I recall, Mike, Somebody asked Martin Luther, "Well, you've you've been you've saved and you're going to heaven. You can sin up your fill." Yeah. And the I think his retort was something like, "Well, how much sin do you think it would take to fill a real believer?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds much like yeah Reformation happening too. Like you know, we like wouldn't have to go very far to borrow. You know, from the Corinthians assembly and and even in Galatians, the the um, you know the the, the infractions there, uh, circumcision. So some of that could be imported. Yeah. So you got to be watchful, Mike. I do. <laughs> you and Wes and James and yeah, you explain. Epoch. You well, explain. Um, are you still in June? That's can you fact. read? Uh, can you read um, verses twenty and twenty-one in Jude? Um, what I'm doing, Phil, here is I'm going to drag you all into this responsibility. <laughs> yes, I was hoping you'd do that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Yes, so the uh, what are the two things? There, there's there's uh, three things mentioned there of how we keep ourselves in God's love for us. What's what's that first one? Building ourselves in the most holy faith, and then praying in the Holy Spirit, and then waiting for the mercy of our Lord. Yes, so building, praying, waiting. That is, that is, uh, the building there. Let let's somebody read Ephesians chapter four. Uh, let me see where I want to start in chapter four. Uh. Verse 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to keep the saints for the work of ministry. Stop right there. To equip the saints for their doing the work of ministry. Okay? Okay, go ahead. Um, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Yeah, okay. Um, so again, sanctification is a community project. It's a whole church project. Notice this. Uh, pastor, teachers, um, 
evangelists, prophets, apostles, they to, are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And then that, and the purpose is that we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. It's talking about the maturity of the body of Christ. Okay, so this is a corporate thing. Um, so that we may no longer be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that passes through the church, speaking the truth in love to one another. You see that? That that is a description uh in jude of what jude calls in verse 20 building yourselves up in your most holy faith verses 11 through 16 here in ephesians 4 describes that for you how that happens how do we build ourselves up in our most holy faith so we're all involved in this process and that's why and and notice Paul says shows that it starts with with uh, teaching leadership, equipping the saints with sound doctrine, uh, and so see how tightly that fits with Paul's approach in Titus. Hey, uh, you need to appoint leaders that are sound in doctrine and sound in living, so that they can teach this faithful message to the believers so that they can um, uh, uh, live soundly as well as a result. So they can devote themselves to every good good work. That's what, kind of like what Wes was talking about earlier. Right? That's he, what I was going to... Hebrews 12, 15, where he says... Where, where the author says, see to it that no one fails to obtain. Um, uh, well, verse 14. And, and um, where are you, Mike? Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, what Wes preached on this morning. I'm just yeah. showing you how all of this fits together. Um, uh, the author says, therefore, lift. And who is he talking to here? Who's the main audience? Is it each individual believer? Is it the believer as an individual? No, it's everybody. It's the church. It's, yeah. yeah, it obviously it pertains to every single believer, but he's talking to the local church. This is what you need to be doing as a church. And obviously the local church can't do that unless every believer is is um uh cooperating involved in this but uh, the author says therefore lift up your drooping hands strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet he's telling the church uh as a family to do this um strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one uh, we'll see the Lord. Verse 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. How do we do that? Well, it's the description that Paul has given us in the book of Titus. It's the description that Jude gave us in verses 20 and 21. It's the description that Paul gave us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, those are various descriptions of local churches um, uh, pursuing the Lord together, corporately. Uh, and, uh, and there's roles. The teaching leadership needs to be teaching sound doctrine and exemplifying sound living. Otherwise, they are not appropriate leaders in the church. Uh, so, and, and Paul is saying, and this so 
contrasts with the false teachers who don't know the truth, don't know the Lord, don't know the grace of God, and uh, they are denying Christ by the way they live, and they are unfit for any good work. Okay. So you see how all this works together? Um, we're going to have to stop there in verse 9. Um, Why? <laughs> because <laughs> we're past time. And we'll return to this uh, next time. And so um, let's let's close in prayer uh, and um, and Deepak, would you mind closing this in prayer and then you can uh, then we'll stop the recording. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sound teaching that we've been getting from this book of Titus. Um, we thank you that um, that your word is alive and active and it's relevant in our lives. And Father, I pray that as we go about our weeks that um, we know there's so much false teaching out in the world mm -hmm. and we encounter it um, you know, on the internet, um, even through um, friends and family. And I pray that you would give us the wisdom to identify um, false teaching and um, on how to approach it. And I pray that we'd be tethered to your word and be in prayer and to be devoted to each other as we go about our lives this week and help us to glorify you and all that we say and do. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.